whoever is listening, welcome back. We're glad to have you in. This is the Man with the Plan podcast, episode 52. At the time of this recording, it's a Tuesday afternoon. Guys, I'm so happy to be back. If you haven't checked out episode 51 or episode 50, I would recommend doing so. Today is just going to be covering college football and the NFL once again, as we do every week here. We're going to cover last night's Monday Night Football game with the Chargers and the Raiders. Crazy stuff. Lightning delays. Hunter Renfro lays a hit stick. The Cardinals were the lone team now undefeated. We're going to see how that stacks up later. We're going to talk the awkward reunion of the Brady Belichick Patriots Bucks showdown and how it lived up to the hype and what to look for in those rookie QBs. And then we're going to cover some college football. So I want to start off with Justin Herbert. Um, I said in the beginning of the season, even last spring in the, in the summer when we were doing these NFL breakdowns, that Herbert was going to be my dark horse MVP candidate. And boy, he has looked to the par. He has looked so good. He makes all the right throws. The Chargers are in sole possession of first place in the AFC West, a division that a lot of people did not expect to be as tough as it is. It is really great to see, especially with Denver. What is it going to be with Teddy Bridgewater after the concussion against the Ravens? Can Drew Locke win this team football games? I don't think so. I don't think Drew Locke, is, it's been three years. I don't think he's as promising. I like the potential. I like the memes, all that stuff. But I think that Teddy Bridgewater gives him a better chance to win. All he does is win football games. He's a good game manager, exactly what Denver needs. A talented roster that does not need to go to waste for another season. The Chargers, on the other hand, have one of the most talented offenses in the NFL, next to the Dallas Cowboys, who looked really impressive yesterday as well. Mike Williams, Keenan Allen. Uh, you got Jalen Guyton. You've got Austin Eckler. Austin Eckler, man, had a fantastic game last night. Justin Herbert, protection. He's getting a lot of uh, good reads, good throws. He's really uh, in a great situation. Brandon Staley, a lot of people are saying first-year head coach. Justin Herbert, second offensive coordinator, second head coach in two years. How is it going to work? Started off 0-1 against the Washington football team and then recovered to beat the Chiefs, the Raiders, a lot of great opponents. You're really starting to see this team take shape, take form as a team that can stretch you down the field, that can run with Austin Eckler. They can do a lot of different things. They got a great pass rush with Joey Bosa. They're really getting a lot of pressure on Derek Carr last night. Joey Bosa's interview was about as funny as it gets. Talking about the refs, talking about the delay, talking about Derek Carr. I don't know why this is a stigma in the NFL about Derek Carr. Like, they're saying that he was scared or whatever, and there's a lot of stuff like he... Apparently cried in the huddle once or all this other stuff. I think Derek Carr and the Raiders will be fine. They had a really slow start on offense, down 21-0. I think Gruden and Mayock have it figured out. Their defense, when they create turnovers, they are one of the scariest teams in the NFL. Trayvon Mullen, a really developing corner, really doing pretty well out of Clemson. A lot of Clemson guys last night. Mike Williams, Tonner Renfro, Trayvon Mullen. A lot of uh, impact players for the Raiders. They got a pass rush problem figured out, Max Crosby. They've got Carl Nassib. They got a lot of great guys on the edge that can make plays consistently. And they almost for a second looked like they were going to take it to overtime. It was that crucial fourth down play that the Chargers were able to convert that made that game out of reach. I really think that both teams are going to be really good. That next matchup when they come go up against each other again, how do these coaches make adjustments? These divisional games, we're going to talk about this with the Cardinals and the Rams. How do these teams make adjustments the second time you play them? Because you're going to see them more than anybody else on your schedule are those division opponents. How do the Chiefs make adjustments against the Chargers? How do the Broncos make adjustments against the Raiders? A lot of interesting stuff. Division opponents are always interesting to see the first couple games and then the next. I think one of the better examples was uh, New England and Miami last year. New England almost thoroughly dominated with Cam Newton week one. They go to Miami week 16. Miami's almost a playoff team and Miami made New England look really uh just put it actually Miami was the team that took them out of playoff contention for the first time in almost 20 years just what a difference that makes uh the Raiders and the Chiefs last year the Raiders I believe went into Kansas City and won and then the Chiefs on the other hand went into Oakland I'm gonna say Oakland I say Oakland all the time man it's so weird I say Oakland and San Diego like they're uh the teams it's the teams that I grew up with it's gonna take a little bit of an adjustment those stadiums, man, are so nice. I keep getting off track when I talk about uh, the Raiders and the Chargers. 
their stadiums are so, so nice. I love it. It's just great. But I think that uh, Oakland is at a fine spot, 3-1. and one. How do they uh, go as the season continues to progress? How do the Chargers continue to build as the season progresses? I think Chargers were going to be a team that got better with, uh, t- with time. Like in November, December, they'd be a much better football team. So if that statement holds up, this could be a team that's really, really dangerous come postseason time because this will be a team that makes the playoffs for sure. Let's talk about Hunter Renfro for a second. Going viral overnight. A lot of podcasts this morning are talking about him. That hit. So it's a fake punt from like the 48 of the Chargers. And for some reason, they, uh, they the guy was left wide open. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Hunter freaking Renfro comes out, lays a hit stick like I've never seen before. People were like, oh my gosh, it's insane. Like the small slot receiver out of Clemson makes an enormous play, makes an enormous hit. A lot of people are saying that his awareness and Madden needs to get raised. He really can do almost anything. And it, you saw it last in Clemson when he was in the national championship, had the game winning touchdown. He had two that year, two that game. And he had a game, he had another touchdown saving tackle against, uh, I think, Ryan Anderson. Recovered a fumble from Wayne Gallman and Renfro uh, took out the knee, took, got to the knee, took it out, and laid him on the ground. It was a. Uh, a lot of things that, like, Renfro is just that guy that you don't expect, but he's one of those true football players that is just every aspect of the game. He's well-tuned. Obviously, he's not a lockdown corner or anything like that, but he's a guy that studies, he does his homework, and he's willing to do whatever it takes to get his team a win, so it was nice to see. All those guys out there who are potentially undersized or potentially not six foot two or this massive hulking figure, there's people like Renfro who could be your ordinary guy, like, Steph Curry. It reminds me a lot of Hunter Renfro just does all the right things. He might not be as explosive as a Steph Curry, but he gets all the things done. He makes all the right choices. He makes the right route reads. He makes a lot of great catches, and he's always reliable when the Raiders need him most. I think that it's a great model for these young football players, and I mean that sincerely, that Renfro may not be the biggest kid out there, but he's doing a heck of a lot of good things, and I think that's really great for Oakland. Oakland. Las Vegas, really great for Vegas, and it's really great for the organization. The Raiders got a steal, and we're going to be talking about that from years to come. All right, so let's shift to this. Um, Let's obviously discuss the elephant in the room. So it happened, the return. Brady versus Belichick. As the day went went and got it, it progressed, I was thinking, man, this game is going to be just I don't think we understand the gravity of this game. I was talking to one of my friends about it. Is that maybe this game's going to be a lot bigger than we think. The presentation, they had Adele do a song for it. I think Hello from the Other Side or whatever it is, is an actual song. But they used it for the promo, which Patriots fans everywhere were uh, crying about, including me. But uh, And uh, whew, and the game, I was really impressed with how New England responded in such an emotional game against a team with Tampa Bay that is much more talented than New England on almost not defensively with their corners because I think Tampa's biggest weakness is their secondary this year. That's why they signed Richard Sherman, who really didn't play all too great against Kendrick Bourne. Um, I think that Tampa's offense was largely predicted to mop the floor with New England, especially in a game where you had Tom Brady coming back, all the rumors coming out this week that – uh. Brady and Belichick didn't like each other. Brady and Belichick had all this beef. There was a lot of noise this this uh, particular game. It is one of the most contentious regular season games that I've ever heard about, been a part of, watched. Even though the game wasn't like some 40-45 to 45 spectacular shootout, I think the game was a real testament to the chess match that Brady and Belichick put on the NFL for the last 20 years. And they were doing it against each other. Belichick was throwing everything he had at Tom. Tom was throwing everything he had at Belichick. I think that there was a lot of really classic New England stuff you saw from both of them making adjustments. I think that they, in the end, with time, if they do indeed have some sort of beef or some nasty relationship, I think time will heal that. Time heals all wounds. I think Belichick and Brady respect the hell out of each other. I think there's a lot of great stuff between the two of them, and I think they can admire that they both are willing to do whatever it takes to win. 
It just didn't end they way, the way that they wanted to. I think Belichick wasn't willing to spend a lot of money on a 43-year-old QB. I don't blame him at the time. And with hindsight, obviously, you go, wow, Brady can clearly play into his late 40s. He's playing at like 44, 43. I, I can't, I'm going to lose track at some point. And I think that uh, that time will tell that uh, those two will have a really pretty fantastic relationship. I think that it's not as contentious as like a Jerry Jones, Jimmy Johnson type thing, but I believe that Brady and Belichick are more on a, not as much of a professional relationship anymore, as much as a mutual respect type thing. But let's talk about the game for a second. The first quarter, it was a, or appeared to be, that the Buccaneers would eventually figure this out and New England was going to look outmatched. But there was one player that I expected to have a decent game, but it was worth every single penny. This offseason, New England went crazy. They spent the most money free agency. It was over about $300 million on Matthew Judon. Had a sack last night, was consistently in the backfield on almost every single play, making Brady uncomfortable, making the defense confident. That's what New England needed last night was confidence. And Matthew Judon was able to deliver that, make make New England believe that they could win this game, especially after a rough performance against the Saints. Matthew Judon leads the team in sacks. He is the life and soul of that defense. He is the embodiment of what a New England Patriots defender should be all about. I was thinking to myself last night that if you had Gilmore, who's going to be back in a couple weeks, this team's going to be really good. They're going to have a lot of, they have had, they do have a lot of new pieces. They've had to figure a lot of things out. Rookie quarterback. There have been worse one in three teams in NFL history. If I had to make a prediction, it's that New England wipes Houston next week and they're it's going to be a really good game with Dallas, a team that I think could really make some noise in the NFC. I think that you're going to see New England have a pretty nasty record for the first couple weeks in September, early October. You're going to count them out, and then they're going to win a lot of football games in November and December and make some noise. I truly believe that. I think Belichick's got the roster that he wants. He's especially got the quarterback that he wants. Mac Jones was poised last night. Not last night, two nights ago. Mac, Joy, Mac Jones was on fire. He was confident. He looked a lot more in control than he did last week. I think all the rookie quarterbacks, Justin Fields, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, I mean, kind of. Trevor Lawrence even looked better week four. Mac Joe, they all looked really settled. They all looked calm. The first month is over for these guys. They're starting to look a little more in control of their destiny, of their situation. You have a lot of good things if you're Jets, Bears, Patriots, Jags. I mean, the Urban Meyer thing we're not going to talk about, but the Jaguars at least have their guy, in my opinion, with Trevor Lawrence. I think that Mac Jones outplayed Tom Brady, and and partial because it's such a big emotional night. I think Brady was doing everything he could to beat the Patriots, and I think sometimes he was throwing the ball with a little too much zip and emotion. Like, I think it was a more emotionally charged game than even he expected, and it showed on the football field, especially in that first half. He looked very unsettled. He looked like he was trying to force a lot of things, and I think Mac Jones, in the biggest moment of his career, Almost came through. We are doinked field goal away from saying the Patriots are 2-2 two and two and looked pretty darn good. And New England also is another fumble away from being 3-1. and one. You have the fumble with Damian Harris. You had the missed field goal two nights ago. We could be saying this new revamped New England Patriots team is one of the best in the AFC, but they're 1-3. and three. There are no moral victories, but I think New England's got a lot of stuff to take away from last night that they could really benefit from. And now, before we take a short break, I want to cover the last undefeated team in football, Arizona. Now, if you told me after Arizona made all those free agent signings that they would be the lone team standing in the NFL at 4-0, I would say that you're crazy, that I don't think Cliff Kingsbury's a good coach, and that I think Kyler Murray is in a desperate situation because I think he needs a better guy around him. But holy cow, have the Cardinals impressed. Not only is Kyler Murray fantastic, an MVP start for sure. DeAndre Hopkins looks really good. A.J. Green looks really good. Rondell Moore looks really good. <laughs> Pretty much every offensive player for the Arizona Cardinals has a role to play and is so well complemented by Cliff Kingsbury's offense. If Kingsbury can do one thing, it's make really creative plays and really keep the defense on their toes. And now the Cardinals have more playmakers on defense. J.J. Watt takes a lot of pressure off Chandler Jones. You've got to account for both of them now. You've got a lot of guys like Byron Murphy, Buda Baker. you got Isaiah Simmons controlling that edge, that linebacker spot. They're making plays. They're causing turnovers. 
each week their defense has gotten better and better. They shut out Tennessee. They survived a really solid Minnesota team. They took care of business in Jacksonville. And then they beat, in my opinion, the best team in the NFL in the Rams. Now, like I said with this divisional stuff with the AFC West, can the Cardinals repeat success against a team they've already seen before and against a team who's seen them already? That game will be in Arizona, which will really help them. But in a division with Seattle, San Francisco, you've got the Rams. Can you be consistent two times against these great opponents? It's the toughest division in football. Now, I think that the Arizona Cardinals have made great strides and given themselves a nice cushion. Can they continue this success? We're going to find out very soon. But keep in mind, the Cardinals did start 5-2 and two last year and then went 8-8. Eight and eight. Can they continue this success? I'm really excited to see if they can do it. Kyler Murray, I believe in him. I think Kyler Murray is a fantastic player. I think this offensive line is protecting him. They got a solid running game. Their defense is creating turnovers, and that's what you like to see. We're going to take a short break. When we get back, we're going to talk Cincinnati's group of five playoff chances, Bo Nix, and Clemson's survival against BC. This is the Man with the Plan podcast. We'll be right back. And we are back. This is the Man with the Plan podcast. Episode 52, more football. This is the best time of the year. I love it so, so, so much. You guys know it. Everybody who watches football loves the Saturday, Sunday times where you just get to sit there, watch football, not a worry or a care in the world. It's great. You get to have an escape. You get to just watch your favorite team, have something to cheer for. You got to love it. So, you know what else I love? I love underdog stories. I love guys who are great leaders who sometimes they go through a little bit of adversity, but in the end, they come out on top. Bo Nix is that underdog. So against Georgia State, Auburn was struggling quite a little bit. And a lot of the uh, narrative around Bo Nix is that he isn't the necessarily greatest quarterback, but he has got a lot of potential, which is what makes his play sometimes really frustrating. He's a really athletic quarterback. He's got a great sense of when to escape from the pocket. And he makes fantastic plays. He reminds me of a uh, lesser version of a Johnny Manziel in that sense where Manziel had a inner clock of when to escape. And he would go out and he make these ridiculous plays. And sometimes that'll get you into trouble. And I think that Bo Nix, he had that great win against Alabama his freshman year. He wins a lot of games. Let's not dispute that. He has a certain moxie to him. He's a great guy, great leader. Just sometimes he made some boat-headed mistakes, and I think that Brian Harson had to light a fry- fire under him and start T.J. Finley to win that game against Georgia State. And so LSU, Auburn hasn't won a game there since, I think, the late 90s. This is what uh, my Auburn friend, Cannon McConnell, who came up to Clemson this weekend to see the escape of BC, said that they hadn't win, had a win in LSU since the 90s. Think about that. You haven't beat a team in a certain place in almost 20 years or almost over 20 years. It's crazy, crazy. So you have Bo Nix come in and light LSU and just it was so much fun to watch. I It's why you like college football. It's why you like football in general. The stories that you get to see, the players that you just are surprised by. I thought personally that that was the end of Bo Nix last week that he would be a backup, his NFL chances even slimmer than what they were before. And I was really impressed. He made a play where he was scrambling to the left and broke like three or four tackles and threw a strike to the end zone. I was like, that is Bo Nix. That is Bo Nix. That was great to watch. No, these I, I will stop saying Bo Picks to my friends for the rest of my life because of that. I loved that. It was great. Bo Nix was a leader. He took everything that came at him in stride. It didn't. He didn't let it get him down. That's what you love to see about college football. You come in, you prove your haters wrong, you prove your prove your doubters wrong, and it's the ultimate underdog story. Come in and beat LSU. They got a big test in Georgia. Wouldn't that be something? If Auburn took down Georgia next week, that would be crazy. Or this Saturday, that would be a story. I think that uh. There's a lot of tests in the SEC. Ole Miss and Arkansas play against each other. Both teams got slapped in the face. 
who responds better. You've got Alabama, who is just wildly better than a lot of teams. But I am still confident in Georgia. I think Georgia is the best team in college football right now. I think that they are uh, lethal. And that's not really a word I would use to describe Georgia as a straight assassin. Their defense with Kirby Smart, Nolan Smith. There's a defensive lineman whose name I certainly... I wish I could remember it right now. He is so freaking good. They got Deion Kendrick from Clemson, who's a great corner. They create turnovers. They get to the quarterback. They're shutting out teams that are really good in Arkansas. They made Clemson uncomfortable. A lot of great teams that Georgia has taken down with a snap of their fingers. We'll see if they can continue that against Auburn. They really just make opponents uncomfortable. Can they do that against Alabama? Can they get to Bryce Young, who's virtually been untouched all season, and end this Alabama versus everyone discussion? Can Georgia be that team? But it's like I said earlier, Georgia and Alabama, inevitably, if they're going to play in the SEC championship as the one and two, they're going to see each other again. I don't really see a college football team other than Georgia and Alabama that won't be in the national championship. I don't think, I think it'll be like 2018. Now, will JT Daniels be healthy enough to play? Can Stetson Bennett, who I think is the best backup in college football, I think he could certainly do it. We will really have to see. And we're going to have a special guest on next week to talk about Georgia football, so stay tuned about that. I want to shift over to Cincinnati. So the group of five, if you're not a major college football fan, is outside this group. They're like the sixth friend in this big friend group that really doesn't get invited to everything. He's kind of the outcast. He's kind of the guy that just joined the friend group. He's the transfer. He came in from a new city. He uh, just needed to find a friend group. He's kind of established. He's uh, made some funny jokes. He's uh, brought everybody over for pizza for a big game or something. He's made everybody impressed, but they don't really know him that long. So they don't really know what his he's worth. He hasn't been there since kindergarten with everybody else. Can Cincinnati be that guy? Can Cincinnati finally shave off that outcast status that they have on them and make the college football playoff this year? They proved a lot to the college football committee with Notre Dame. So Notre Dame, going into Notre Dame, is a tough ask for any team. That's a hostile environment. That's a place that Clemson lost last year. It's a place that a lot of teams have struggled in. I think that Cincinnati proved a lot. Desmond Ritter, Heisman QB, potentially. I don't really watch a lot of Cincinnati football for that same reason because they are a group of five team. They're not always on the top channels. They're not getting the recognition. It's that outcast kid. But they did bring that pizza against Notre Dame, and it was pretty good. And I was impressed. Can they continue to be that friend in that friend group that continues to pull his stock up? I really am impressed with it. I'm really impressed with what Luke Fickle has done with the culture. I think they have a legitimate shot. Now, will they beat necessarily a Georgia or an Alabama? I don't think so, but I think getting a group of five team in the playoff to have that discussion is worthy this year. There's so much chaos. Oregon went down. You had Notre Dame go down. You had Florida go down. There's a lot of teams that have just fallen off. Why not put Cincinnati in? This is the exact year. There's not a Clemson or an Ohio State lock-in. The Big Ten's going to beat each other up eventually with Michigan, Iowa, Penn State, and Ohio State. Michigan looks legit. Maybe they could be the fourth team. Imagine a playoff with Alabama, Georgia, Michigan, and Cincinnati. That would be nuts. Not for the geographic sense because you'd have North and South. That would be crazy. That Actually, I kind of want that now. I'm going to book it. I want that. That's our great. That sounds great. I'm going to call it that. That'd be great for Harbaugh. That'd be great for the group of five. Be great for Kirby Smart. I mean, if great, it'd be great for Alabama, but we were pretty much all expected this. So there's your playoff committee. I got it down for you. Michigan, four. Cincinnati, three. Georgia, two. Alabama, one. There's your dream playoff. We're going to leave it at that. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But uh, that would be fun to see. So at the end of this, before we wrap up, in this very jargled, scrambled football talk, I want to talk about DJ Uyunglele and Clemson football. So I was there Saturday night against Boston College, and gosh darn, you cannot beat Death Valley on Saturday nights. I love it so much. It is one of my favorite things in the world. The buses come in, Dabo runs a 40-yard dash to the logo, defense is flying everywhere. The offense looked better. Clemson just certainly improved against a Boston College team that looks really good. They competed really well in a tough spot. I think both teams had opportunities to win. 
I think Clemson took more of those opportunities. They scored when they needed to. I think that the play calling is something that needs to improve, but there was a lot of improvement. I really liked what I saw from DJ. I think he had a lot of great throws. Some of them should have been caught. He was really improving, and gosh dang it, it makes me hard. It makes me not want to be frustrated when I see him going out to Death Valley at like one o'clock in the morning. And a lot of people are going to be cynical and say that it's for like the media, it's for the cameras. But I think DJ is a guy that really cares and wants to hone in on his craft. And I think that he really wants to improve. It's tough to be the replacement for a quarterback in Trevor Lawrence. I mean, look at Cam Newton last year. Having to replace Tom Brady, of all people, the six-time Super Bowl champion. Hey, DJ's has to replace the best quarterback in college football we've seen in a long time. Of course it's going to be difficult for anybody. Of course it's going to be difficult for an offensive line to adjust. Of course it's going to be difficult for teams to just adjust to that style. I think that... uh. Clemson's made some strides. They're not going to be in the playoff every year. That's reality. That's just what happens. But are they going to be a good football team come November, December? I think so. I think they improved a lot. They made some changes to the offensive line that I really liked. Moved Bockhorst back to guard, his true spot, where he really excelled in, and they made a lot of holes in for the run game. Kobe Pace, Phil Maffa, a lot of great spots. The receivers, can Clemson get healthier? Will Shipley, James Skalski came back. There's a lot of great things for Clemson. It's just not going to be a playoff year, and that's okay. Not a lot of programs get to say they have six straight playoff appearances. It just doesn't happen every single year like we want it to. But maybe a near six bowl. That's what you got to look for, Clemson. So we're going to take a uh, little bit of a deep dive into what I believe is the biggest matchup, Iowa-Penn State. We're going to talk about it real quick. I really think that the Big Ten is in a prime spot right here. Iowa Penn State's a big matchup. Bob, if you're listening, you guys, if you haven't listened to the interview with Bob Murrow, he's an Iowa Hawkeye super fan. This is one of the biggest games he will ever see. I think Iowa's in a great position to make the playoff. Penn State is a great football team. Sean Clifford, they got a new culture. They've established it after a rough 2020. They're back. Can the Big Ten sustain a playoff team? I think they really can this year. Will it be Iowa, Penn State, Michigan, or Ohio State? My prediction right now is Michigan. I think Michigan's legit this year. J.J. McCarthy is a really great quarterback. I know they have a little bit of a rotation right now, so it's a little weird, but I think that they've really made some significant strides. They play great on defense. Jim Harbaugh is a fantastic coach. We don't need to forget that. This is the Man with the Plan podcast. Thank you guys for listening. This was just a football scramble. It was great. It was fun. I really enjoyed it. I love just getting all my thoughts out to you guys. You guys are the best. As always, have a fantastic day, and we'll see you next time. Take care.